Hi, everyone. I come from the University of Michigan, uh, where I direct a new initiative called Poverty Solutions that's emphasizing action-based work with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And as a new initiative just about one year old, I think we aspire to have a, a conference like this at some point uh, with this kind of crowd. So uh, congratulations to the team at uh, the Stanford Poverty Center, and thanks for including me. I was asked to, uh, for this issue, do a, a, a little bit of work on uh, women, men, and poverty, and I uh, was glad that I didn't use the word gender, since this is all uh, uh, sex-related. And this work is co-authored with Beth Mattingly and Catherine Eden. Uh, in this first slide, we just take a look at uh, poverty rates for men and women uh, using the current population survey official data uh, going back from, uh, for, for the whole series, 1968 to 2016. Uh, we limit to uh, uh, folks 25 and older uh, to give people the chance to get through their education. And you can see uh, in the above two lines where uh, women are in dashed blue and men are in dashed green that there's a persistent poverty gap uh, between adult men and women going back all the way through the series uh, that uh, narrows just a little bit uh, in the 1990s. It might have something uh, might be related and somewhat to uh, the last presentation, uh, but stays quite large, about uh, uh, four to six percentage points uh, across the time series. So uh, we see, by the official poverty rate, uh, a long-standing, persistent uh, gap uh, in poverty rates between men and women. Uh, of course, anyone who knows my work knows that uh, I think that uh, we need to look at uh, gradations within uh, poverty, uh, thinking that not all poverty is alike. And uh, this is just one example from some work that I'm doing, look at rates of eviction uh, in the uh, Survey of Income and Program Participation, the only survey that's collected eviction rates uh, going back to the 1990s. And in red, you'll see uh, the rate of eviction for uh, households reporting uh, incomes below the deep poverty line, that's half the, half the poverty rate. Uh, in green, uh, those in uh, what might be called uh, shallow poverty or between 50 and 100% of the poverty line, uh, and then up the income spectrum. So you can see a clear gradation of, uh, of risk of, uh, an, of a hardship such as eviction uh, going all the way up to the, uh, through the income ladder. And clearly, f uh, households in deep poverty uh, uh, have much higher rates of eviction than any other subgroup. In fact, uh, I note that at its peak, the, the, the next group, the, 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 those in poverty but not in deep poverty, at the height of the Great Recession still had uh, eviction rates that are lower uh, than any point in the series for uh, the deep, those in, in deep poverty. If we go back to figure one, uh, we see then uh, the bottom line is the deep poverty gap between men and women. And we can see that that also actually is uh, quite persistent across the CPS series and uh, about two percentage points between men and women. If we take a, a little bit of a more comprehensive look at income, uh, this just plots uh, adult men and women uh, uh, in income up to 500% of the poverty rate. Uh, so you can see uh, what this looks like across the income distribution. Uh, we see that, uh, that this uh, disadvantage actually persists all the way up at the, the, the top. So women have a, a higher likelihood of being in deep poverty, of uh, in poverty but not in deep poverty, uh, of near, being near poor, uh, and a much less uh, lower level of, uh, of, of incomes above 500% of the poverty line. So higher income, the, the gap there is about four percentage points. Of course, some of this gap might be an artifact of the way that we measure poverty. Uh, so uh, we, uh, many of us know that the official poverty measure only takes uh, the family unit as those that are related by blood and marriage. So it would exclude uh, cohabiting uh, men uh, in a family unit of, uh, headed by a, a single mom, you might say, uh, and also uh, excludes uh, non-cash and, uh, and taxation benefits uh, that uh, may disproportionately go to households, particularly headed by single mothers. So uh, here we just look at 2016 official poverty rates, again, adult men and women, uh, and supplemental poverty rates. So the supplemental poverty measure is one that tries to uh, address some of the shortcomings of the official poverty rate. 
uh, and, uh, and also uh, update the uh, threshold, the poverty threshold, uh, by which we uh, gauge the, 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 the resources that we expect families should go above uh, by accounting for geographic differences in the cost of living, something I'm sure those of you who live here know something about. Uh, and, and so you can see that in both cases, OPM and SPM both find that women have higher rates of poverty than men, uh, but the supplemental poverty me measure narrows the gap somewhat. So whereas uh, by the supplemental poverty measure, uh, women have maybe 1.2 times the, the rates of poverty than men, by the official poverty measure, it's about 1.4 times uh, the rate of poverty. So one question is, does the SPM get it right? So the SPM clearly makes a lot of improvements to our poverty measure. It also relies on a lot of assumptions about uh, income sharing across households and the value of non-cash benefits. Uh, so uh, I've been thinking some about uh, using uh, some of our hardship measures as, a, as, as somewhat of an arbiter between these two measures to see in, in different cases which is coming closer to the truth. So, uh, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, our official poverty rate is about 15%. The uh, supplemental poverty rate uh, is a little over 16% in uh, 2011. This is the most recent date that I have some of these hardship measures for. Uh, we also see that uh, the rate of households reporting that they failed to meet their essential household expenses, again, in the survey of income and program participation, is about 16%, and the food insecurity rate is. Uh, 15%. So uh, I think that starts to give us some confidence that uh, the poverty rate is, is across a, a number, a series of metrics, households that are failing to have the resources they need to uh, meet their household expenses and uh, have enough food for a healthy and productive life is about in the, in the right range. And in a poverty rate uh, that we're much lower uh, is perhaps uh, not, uh, uh, isn't reflective of conditions on the ground. Uh, I think we can use this uh, as, a, as a little bit of a test between OPM and SPM here, where we find that uh, the official poverty rate, as I said, women are about 1.2 uh, times more likely to be in poverty. SPM, I'm sorry, 1.4, SPM 1.2. The food insecurity rate uh, for uh, adult men and women uh, is, uh, again, women are, have a higher rate of food insecurity, uh, but uh, it is in line with the supplemental poverty rate. So uh, the household food insecurity for adult women is about 1.2 times uh, the rate for men. So uh, across a series of measures, adult women report higher rates of poverty and hardship than men. This hold true, holds true by deep poverty, overall poverty, and near poverty, by the official and the supplemental poverty measure, although SPM narrows the disparity, and by household food insecurity, which finds that food hardship rates are in line with the gap uh, shown by the supplemental poverty rate. Now, uh, stratifying by other characteristics, such as race, would likely offer a more nuanced story. So we might find, of course, that uh, across all these rates that, uh, say, uh, men of color have higher rates of poverty and hardship than uh, uh, white females. Um, and, uh, of course, it also would be important to consider how this story might change if the institutionalized population was added, one that's completely omitted from our, house, our primary household surveys. Thank you.